I've come to learn that usability testing is one of the most valuable tools when it comes to developing great products. And the greatest thing about it is it's actually pretty easy. So what is a usability test? Simply put, it's getting real people to use your product, putting it in front of them and walking them through a guided test, but getting their real honest feedback. Because traditionally, product owners, whether it be from a startup to a larger enterprise, they make products and they're internally focused. They don't see the big picture. They'll try to, but it's a whole different thing to put it in front of a user. When you're a programmer or a designer or a great inventor, you don't see things the way most people do. And this is a really critical and interesting thing that usability testing really helps cut right through. And um, everyone who is a product owner or is working on something that they're passionate about should be user testing their product. So how do you do a usability test? Well, there's a lot of ways to do it. And I think the simplest way to start is something simple, like a gorilla style test where you go to, let's say a coffee shop or uh, a favorite hangout or bar where you uh, can find people who are willing to be social, maybe have some downtime and you can pull them aside and say, hey, can I borrow you for, I don't know, maybe half an hour and ask you some questions, offer them a cup of coffee, maybe a gift certificate. Definitely some incentive will uh, make it worth their time. And the key, I think the biggest key of anything when you're giving a test is to build rapport with the person who is using the product. It's very important to establish this connection and make them feel comfortable because you want them to be able to give their honest feedback and reactions and be open. And I think that is one of the things that I most enjoy about it is building that rapport and getting to know people, starting off by asking them some get to know you questions. This is good not only to learn about demographics in general of your audience, but to establish sort of a, hey, we're just talking here. We're just hanging out. And there's nothing formal about it. You know, in general, we call it usability testing, but we try to avoid that word test when we're doing this because the key thing, this is very key and it bears repeating at times, is to let them know that we are testing the product. We are not testing you. They can't do anything wrong. And if you make them fully aware of this, that it is really just by participating and giving their honest feedback that failure is actually helpful. Sometimes it's more helpful than success or at least a sort of half success, sort of like, eh, you know, it was fine. The goal of a great usability facilitator is to get that great, honest reaction and feedback. Building rapport is just, it's, it's, a, it's a crucial skill, but it's a pretty fun one. I mean, if you like talking to people, it's, that's what it's about. It's about being a people person. Uh, but at the same time, you wanna be as neutral as possible. You can be their friend, but you don't wanna to react too much to what they're saying. You don't want them to go into this, oh, I want to please them mode, you know? You want to be Geneva, Switzerland. You want to be as neutral as possible. So that's kind of some of the intro basics and uh, I'll get into a couple of the more formula formalized ways to go through usability tests, but let's talk about some of the different elements of the test. And traditionally, after your get to know you questions, it's best to start with their initial impressions. Initial impressions are where you sometimes get some of the most interesting insights of all because it's their first impression, you know? And you only get to make a first impression once, as we all know. And that gut reaction can really tell you a lot. You know, ask them, what do you think this does? What, what's going on here? And you may be quite surprised. Uh, there's a couple ways to do this and it depends on what you're testing. If it's a application like a, web, uh, a website, um, I would say a great thing to start with is a blink test. That's where you show them the website, usually the homepage for maybe five seconds, quickly, and then take it away from them. And then ask, what do you remember most about that site? What stood out to you? What do you think it does? Because in particular when it comes to websites, you know, you have a very limited time span to capture attention. And if your call to action or your central message or branding doesn't come through quickly and immediately, you really might wanna think about a redesign. And sometimes surprising things will jump out at a user when they first look at a site 
and it may not be what you intended. You want to make sure that your crucial elements, like a call to action, um, jump out right away. So that's a great place to start. With a mobile app, uh, not, not as crucial because they're kind of going there for a more a general purpose and they've downloaded something and they're sort of ready to interact with it. They're not going to make that split decision quite as quickly. Uh, however, a great thing to do for both of these is what's called an expectancy test. And that's where you ask, um, so what do, you, what do you expect to happen here? What do you expect these icons to do, for instance? What do you expect to be able to click on? Again, you may be really surprised what people think is clickable or what certain icons mean. It's very hard to develop a consistency in um, iconographic language. And uh, this is something in the testing that I've done for startups and in my job with Prococity that I see it's not consistent what people think. And labels, gosh, I tell you, labels can be so, so helpful. And as much as it may not be the cleanest design ever, it's oftentimes functionally really useful just to have simple labels on things, except for maybe the very obvious like, oh, the gear uh, being the settings or the hamburger menu. But even the hamburger menu sometimes will confuse people. Definitely seen it before. So that's a really great thing to test is what they're expecting and it will tell you a lot. So once you go through the expectancy portion, I think it's usually about at this point where you can really jump into the tasks and the scenarios. This is kind of the meat of the test and what you're really here for is to see can they perform the functions that this app or website is intended to do. And it's usually best to set up with a scenario of some type so they have the proper context and they can kind of get in that mindset. And again, you're really trying to build rapport with the, with the subject and so it really helps to sort of frame that frame their mind and sort of say, hey, this is what you are, this is what you're doing, and then give them a task. It's usually, I usually recommend keeping the tasks somewhat simple. If there's a long complex process, um, you know, like in an application, you're doing a multifunctional thing, step by step, you know, take it one task at a time, especially at the beginning, because users at the beginning you know, it takes a little while to get familiar with something. There's often a learning curve and you want to be sort of aware of that and you don't want them to get too frustrated too early unless it's, you know, required right out of the gate to perform complex tasks, which I wouldn't really recommend. That's not a good UX, you know. You want to keep it simple, functional, understandable. And, you know, usability testing in general will really help you realize what's working, what's not. So as you go through your tasks, Take them slow at first, keep them simple. You can kind of ratchet up the complexity as you go forward. So once you go through all your tasks, you know, you can do several. You can do five, you can do 10, you can even maybe do 20. Just make sure and run through your test before, practice it and make sure you can do it all within say an hour or so. You don't want your test to go too much longer than that because the user will start getting, you know, a bit worn out. You'll get maybe worn out. You want to do multiple tests. You don't really need to do that many though. You'd be surprised. Um, three to five tests will usually tell you plenty, uh, at least to start with. You'll notice so much wrong that you need to fix within those three to five that, you know, rather than testing 10 on one iteration, test three to five, fix some stuff, and then come back again. Iterate, test, iterate, test. That's sort of the magic of usability testing is you can constantly be changing and learning throughout the way and be very nimble and you don't have to worry about correcting large swaths of data, doing a big beta test where you've got a hundred, you know, thousand plus users. It can be little granular bits, but they tell you a lot. Um, more than a product owner probably wants to know. It can be a little painful, uh, but they'll usually understand and just by watching a user fail at certain things and succeed at others, they can really realize what's working and what's not. And by the end, you'll usually notice, especially if the, uh, the application is well designed and the layout's thoughtful and the visual language is speaking to them that they will start to pick things up. And, you know, throughout the test, definitely ask them to rate the task. Usually we do a one to seven, one to five scale uh, from one being very difficult, like a seven scale uh, being very easy. Ask them how 
easy that was, you know? Um, and then ask them why, especially when they pick lower ratings. And you'll find that those ratings will often go up throughout the test, especially as you start getting some repetition or using uh, systems that you've picked up throughout the application itself. So definitely be checking on their intuitiveness uh, throughout the test. Those are key uh, quantitative metrics that you want to have. You know, quantitative being sort of the numbers behind it and qualitative being more the thoughtful, informational kind of things. Um, so, you know, as a facilitator, you're really just walking them through the, the, the test. If you have the ability to have a logger, someone there who can record the notes, that's great. It's not required. It's definitely a nice benefit. Um, secondary importance, but um, I would say what's primary important is record the session in some way. Uh, audio, definitely. Uh, I really recommend video too. It's great to see fa facial expressions and you know just being able to sort of cognitively go back and really watch and experience the test again is really helpful. So you know it can be as simple as a webcam. We like to use a piece of software called OBS. Uh, it's freeware. It has great streaming capabilities, and you can uh, you know put in multiple sources into a nice array. If you need to do just a straight screen capture, I recommend QuickTime. Um, just watch out if you do go into video post production, you have to worry about the uh, the frame rate. Uh, QuickTime records at a variable frame rate. You can change that using tools like Handbrake. Um, to change it to a constant frame rate and I'm getting a little technical here But if you're doing any sort of post-processing in video, it's really important to note uh, your these things for sync and uh, I've had some issues there and I don't want you to have to fall into the same trap So uh, I'll list the tools uh, that I talk about in this at the bottom of the description here and uh, Yeah, definitely check it out. They're all free and people may want to watch along while you do the test too There's some great software for that. There's zoom meeting, uh, which is a great service uh, I like a lot with great screen sharing capabilities. There's Skype, of course, um, although with their recent redesign, I'm not really feeling the new UX of it. It's, it's okay, um, but you know, just it, it may have some issues. So just be sort of aware and you don't want your, uh, your Skype call or whatever to hang up the test and have technical issues. So uh, just sort of be aware of that. You know, there's, there's so many different settings too. You know, there's, like I said, there's the gorilla testing. You can take this in a really formal usability lab, which is what we do with Project UX. You can sort of set one up yourself at a home office or, um, you know, some type of office space. So there's different sort of levels of formality you can go into, but really no matter where you are, again, it's all about being personable and making them feel comfortable. You don't want it to feel too clinical. And they may first, when they walk in there, feel a little like, whoa, I'm under this microscope, you know, people are watching me, you know, maybe someone's looking at me through a two-way mirror, a one-way mirror, but, you know, just try and make them forget about it. If you really just talk to them and develop that connection, eventually they'll kind of forget about the cameras a little bit. They'll really get focused in, and especially if the app is any good or interesting, they'll really want to learn and see, hey, maybe I can actually learn something myself and then give them something to learn from. And you just really want to reiterate that positive feedback, you know, uh, thank them for their feedback, uh, even if it's not so great, you know, um, but most of the time it is. Tell them it's helpful. Tell them thank you, you know, even when they fail at something. Say, you know, thanks. We, we, we hadn't noticed that before. Oh, we see an issue here. Uh, we'll, we're taking note of this. We appreciate it. And you're really helping us out. And I highly recommend Steve Krug's book, Rocket Surgery Made Easy. It's got a lot of great information about how to conduct a usability test and he's got great resources like an awesome usability testing script that you can use as your blueprint uh, and modify based upon what your needs are. It's a great intro, great opening to get people comfortable with and set the stage. Uh, recording permission forms available as well. Make sure you get their consent to record. And you know, I really think I've learned a lot from reading his books. Uh, there's a lot of books out there that have actually been really valuable uh, to me to learn from. And you know, obviously there's tons of resources online. There's tons of great information out there. And don't hesitate to just soak it all up. You know, uh, Go check out some meetups, go to a design conference, go to uh, another kind of conference, uh, meet people. You, know, you definitely wanna do some of that uh, introvert style learning, but then the extrovert is very important as well, especially in UX. You know, it definitely requires being a people person to some degree. Communicating is a big part of UX. And you know, user experience is just, it's everywhere, it's in everything. You know, everything has a user experience, so don't shy away from that. You know, getting out there and talking to people and you know, challenge yourself, you know, get out of your comfort zone. Uh, whether you're a startup, 
you're a designer, you're just interested in tech, you're maybe looking to break into the field, user testing can help you. And I hope you will go out and try. Thank you so much for watching. Hope you got something out of this and uh, feel free to subscribe and like our channel. Got a Patreon account if you want to support us. We'd really appreciate it and uh, go out there, do your thing.